let's do another problem with Markov chain Monte Carlo. This one is going to show how MCMC can be used with models that might be intractable analytically. For example, they might have discontinuities or choices in the forward statistical model, as we're going to see here. This is a problem that's worked out in detail in Numerical Recipes 3rd edition, so you can look there for code, for example. I call this the lazy bird watcher problem. What's the setup? You hire somebody to sit in the forest and look for mockingbirds. And they're supposed to report the time, t sub j, of each sighting. They record it in a notebook, so it's simply a list of times. But they're lazy, and they only write down every k oneth sighting. So for example, if k1 equals 3, they only write down in the notebook every third sighting. But it's exactly every third. Even worse, however, at some time t sub c, they get a young child to do the counting for them, and they go off to the local tavern. And this child doesn't recognize mockingbirds, and he counts grackles instead. Furthermore, the child writes down only every k2 sightings, which might be different from k1. So perhaps the child has k2 equals 2 and writes down every other sighting. So you want to salvage something from this totally messed up data. You'd like to know, for example, what was the average rate of sightings of mockingbirds that you're actually interested in, and of grackles, perhaps, which you might now be interested in because you have data on them. And you're given only the list of times. You don't know who wrote the times, and you don't know what the integers k1 and k2 are, nor do you know tc, the critical time when the observer was replaced by the child. So the fact that you can do this at all hinges on the fact that this is Poisson process data, and that even if the averages of two Poisson processes are the same, you could distinguish where every third event is written down from where every first event is written down because of basically the fluctuations in the data will be different. And we'll see how this works out now in the mathematics. What we're hoping is that this difference in fluctuations is enough to let us recover useful information on these unknown parameters k1, k2, and tc. And this is just a perfect problem for Markov chain Monte Carlo, as you, s you will see, because it's easy to write down the forward statistical model, but hard to figure out analytically how to invert that. So what do we need to know to get a forward statistical model? Well, this is a Poisson process of rate lambda, and we're going to write down every kth event. And the waiting time for the kth event in a Poisson process turns out to be gamma law distributed. That is to say, if tau is the difference between the time of event i and event i plus k, then the probability of tau in terms of the parameters k and lambda is given by this expression, which is the expression for a gamma probability distribution. Furthermore, non-overlapping intervals are independent draws from this distribution. An example of a non-overlapping interval would be from ti to ti plus k, and then from ti plus k to ti plus 2k. Well, I'm just asserting this, but in fact it's pretty easy to prove, so let's just fill in the proof. The probability of an interval tau times a little d tau, um, that requires that we have had k minus 1 counts in an interval tau. And that's going to just be a Poisson distribution, because this is a Poisson process. And then it also requires that there, in fact, be a single count in that last little interval d tau. So we write down the Poisson probability for the interval having k minus 1 counts, and that's this expression here. You should recognize that as Poisson with mean lambda tau, since lambda is the rate and tau is the time interval.
And then we get this extra from this term. We get this extra lambda d tau, which comes in here. And if we cross out the d taus on each side, you'll see that this now, with the additional lambda, is exactly what was written up here as the gamma process. There's this close relationship between the gamma distribution and the Poisson discrete distribution. OK, so the forward model of this whole experiment, the probability of the data given the unknown parameters, says that we take the probabilities of all the intervals that are before this critical time Tc, and therefore they have parameters k1 and lambda1, and we multiply together, because they're independent probabilities, all of those probabilities. Then we look at all the intervals that occur after Tc, and we multiply their probabilities together. But now they have a different couple of parameters. They have the parameters k2 and lambda2. This is a complete model, because if we were given the parameters t sub c, k1, lambda1, k2, lambda2, and the list of times, we could evaluate the probability of that particular data set. Now to do Markov chain Monte Carlo, we have to have a proposal generator. And this is often the creative part of getting MCMC to work well. If you have a proposal generator that's exploring the space very, very inefficiently, then in principle it might be ergodic, but in practice it might take the age of the universe to fill the space and give you a good distribution. So we're going to have to be a little bit clever. Well, for Tc, the critical time, we don't really have to be clever. We can just take a small additive change in Tc, for example, drawn from a normal distribution, pretty much the way that we did that in the previous example on all the parameters. Here it's just a one-dimensional normal distribution. Now for lambda 1 and lambda 2, we already have to start being a little bit clever, because these are positive rates, and we don't want the possibility that we could take a step to a negative rate. So a good thing to do is to step them by small multiplicative changes. This, equivalently, we could say that we're going to draw the changes from a log normal distribution. The only complication that this introduces, if we go all the way back two lectures ago to our derivation of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, you'll recall that the acceptance probability alpha is not just the ratio of the posteriors. It actually also has this funny ratio of q's, where this comes from the proposal generator. Now, when we choose a normal distribution for q, then this cancels out. The q's cancel out because it's symmetric under interchanging its two arguments. And you can see that the numerator and denominator just exchange the arguments. But now that we're going to draw from a log normal distribution, the log normal distribution is not quite symmetric because it has this x down here normalizing it. This is, of course, the general expression for a log normal distribution. And that breaks the symmetry because the x at, on one argument won't be the same as the x on the other argument. So the ratio of q's brings in simply from this term a ratio of x's. And we do have to include that correctly, otherwise we won't be exploring the space exactly in proportion to the posterior probability. Now what about the steps for these integer variables, k1 and k2? You might think that that's easy enough, that we could just step by 0 maybe most of the time, and occasionally plus or minus 1. But this is actually a bad idea and wouldn't work. The reason is because if the rates of sighting birds, if the lambdas have converged to about the right rate, and then you suddenly change k, which I remind you is whether we're recording every other sighting or every third sighting or some integer value like that, and then we suddenly change k, then the lambdas will suddenly be way off because we will have had the same times applied to, for example, switching from recording every bird to recording every other bird. 
In that case, what would happen is that the steps will almost always be rejected because we'll take a step to a really wrong value of lambda, the probability of the model will go way, way down, and the acceptance probability, therefore, will say almost always reject that step. If the number of rejected steps is exponentially large, then this method is never going to get anywhere. So we can't do this for the step in k. But describing the problem has also indicated what the solution is. It's OK to step k by 0 plus or minus 1, but only if that step also changes lambda by the right proportion so that we keep lambda over k, which is an approximation to how often every time is going to be written down, to keep that constant. So in the context of this model, that's the genuinely small step because it changes only the fine details of the clumping statistics and therefore might or might not be rejected by the Metropolis-Hastings step rather than changing some gross feature of the converged solution which will almost always be rejected. This is a key idea so this would be a good place to stop the lecture and think about it and then proceed. Well, let's try it. I'm not going to show you actual code because that's written down in the numerical recipes book, but here are the results. We're going to simulate a notebook that contains a thousand bird sightings, so a thousand values of TI. And when I made the simulation, I of course knew what the parameters were, so I'll tell you them up front even though they're a secret. The actual parameters were that mockingbirds were sighted at a rate of three per minute, Grackles were cited at a rate of 2 per minute. It's at time 200 minutes that we switch observers. And it turns out that the first observer that we hired actually was honest. He recorded every single bird sighting, whereas it was the child who recorded only every other bird sighting. OK, let's see if the MCMC can find those parameters. We're of we, of course, don't know the secret values, so we're going to start with wrong values. We'll start with rate 1 for mockingbirds, rate 3 for grackles, transition time of 100, and let's imagine that both birds, all of them, were counted because we don't know otherwise. Uh, and I'm going to show you in this plot as a function of the step number in the Markov chain Monte Carlo that has nothing to do with how many birds there are in the data set. This is just how many Monte Carlo steps we take. Um, and I'm going to show you what values it is currently sitting on for the two rates and for the critical time. So we start here at 3 and it quickly decides that that's way too high a rate and it starts reducing it. Similarly, 1 is way too low a rate, so it starts increasing it. And then here, a very interesting thing happens. Here, it decides that it does a trial step changing the value of k2 from 1 to 2, and in fact, 2 is the correct answer. And of course, that results because of our stepping algorithm in the corresponding increase by a factor of 2 in the rate lambda 2. In other words, there are twice as many birds, but we record only every other one, and so that's the same rate. And after that, it really likes that, although along here it's tried many, many trials of changing the values of k. It really does like these values of k. It ought to because they're the correct values. Note also that the critical time is coming up to what its correct value is, namely 200. I've plotted it here divided by 200, so 1 is the correct value in this graph. comes up to the correct value. Um, it's helped along once we know the correct value of k2, but at a certain point it really locks in. It really knows probably plus or minus just one of these sightings, which are the sightings with one value of lambda and which are the values with the other la value of lambda. So we see that basically we have these two stages. We have the burn-in period while the model comes down the, uh, or I should say climbs 
through the valleys, the cliffs, and so on, and finds pretty much what the Bayes maximum is. And ultimately, we would be throwing that out if we wanted to look at any properties of this model. But then once we've settled in, we get this ergodic period during which we're actually recording the data of these parameters and exploring the full Bayes posterior uh, of the model. If we look only in that second ergodic period and ask how accurately have we determined the two rate parameters, lambda 1, the rate of sighting mockingbirds, and lambda 2, the rate of sighting grackles, and of course these are the true rates. These have taken out the effects of recording only every other one or every third one. Um, we get distributions like this. And this gives us with an idea with this amount of data how accurately we know these parameters. The true values you'll recall are 2 and 3. So this one we've learned that it's 2 and we have a fairly narrow spread of errors, that is to say estimate of the uncertainty. Um, these are the actual Bayes posteriors of the model. And we could equally do joint probabilities, covariances, and so on and so forth. Um, but notice, coming back to this one, that the center that we got here isn't centered on 3. Um, the true value is here, and no matter how long we run the model, it'll basically just fill in this curve smoother and smoother. What's going on here? Well, we've seen this several times before. We're not adding more data as we take more Monte Carlo steps. A particular data set implies a particular best estimate or uh, modal estimate of the parameter, not necessarily the true value. So convergence of the model is to the Bayes posterior for that data, not to something unknowable like what the true value would be if we had an infinite amount of data to look at.